Do y'all hear that sound? I guess it sounds different because of, because, you know, the, the world calls it social distancing. But what do we call it? Saints distancing, right? We're saints distancing, right? Because nothing can separate the body, right? Praise Yahweh. All right. We are on page 77 here. We're on the third um, the third part of Holy Spirit, Spirit Holy will overshadow you, making the connection. And remember, that's what the, this whole book is talking about, making that connection with Yahweh. Okay? And last week, we, we, we left off about covering about the little child, where Yeshua said you must humble yourself as that child. Okay? So, let's start off here on page... Oh, you know, I forgot to... I forgot to number the verses, so I apologize for that. But in the book, that's on page 77, um, we can go down to the, to the um, third paragraph here where it says, the whole point is this. Y'all see that? The whole point is this. The child has to be teachable. You see that part? Yeah. Okay. So it says, the whole point is this. The child has to become teachable like Yeshua did. Yeshua was probably, probably knew more than the priest did when he went to college. The questions he was asking these priests, they could not answer. Notice. He asked the questions for them, but it didn't change them. Okay? Now you can imagine that Yeshua was, was very young. Okay? Let's look at this because the fact is that here he was, 12 years old, and he was talking to them, to the priests, asking them questions, and they were astonished at the answers from him, right? Let's look at something here in Luke. In Luke, oh wow. In Luke 12, Luke 2, verse 46 and 47, he says, Finally, after three days, they found him. Remember, remember they had gone to the feast, the parents had left, and they went looking for Yeshua. And so finally, after three days, they found him in the sacred precinct, sitting in the midst of the doctors, who of course are the teachers of the law of Yahweh, both listening to them and asking them questions. And then notice verse 47, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Okay, they were astonished that this boy, the twelve-year-old boy, knew so much and understood the the scriptures so well to where he could actually teach them. This growth in wisdom, of course, and understanding, it continued with him until adulthood. Because when you look at verse fifty-two, it says, "And Yahshua increased in wisdom and in age and in honor with Yahweh and with man." So this is as he began to grow up. Okay. But if you notice verse 40, this actually started at a very early age from birth, in fact, because this right after they came from uh, having him circumcised, verse 40 says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit and filled with wisdom, and the honor of Yahweh was upon him. So he, from a very young age, Yahweh began working with Yeshua, of course, teaching and guiding him and so forth. But if you notice here that it says the, the child, the child grew, okay? The child grew. Let's look at that word, uh, something here, because the pastor says in the second book of Israel, chapter 44, verse 124, he said, do you remember the sermon I brought on genes? What Yahweh could do through your genes? He could create things in mankind and call certain people down through the ages. He knew the genes at one moment would be bred into other genes, to the point that he could bring forth a Savior who would not turn against him. Think of that power that is there. This is how he could predict that this man would be faithful all the way up until he dies on the stake and not allow Satan to tempt him. He predicted all of this. He knew through the genes that the breeding would be to the point that he could safely trust and make the prediction that Yahshua would do certain things. <laughs> it, it's, it's, that is just so astounding, you know, when you think about that, what Yahweh was able to do and what he does. I mean, this is how he brought you to his house in these last days. It's the same, through the same process. You were through a breeding program. He brought you to a certain point. And that's why you answered that calling. Okay, back on the book here. Now, he, he was talking to the priests, and they were astonished. Uh, he answered the questions for them, okay, and notice it says, he was there as a little child seeking information. You see that part? 
underlined starting from, he was there as a little child seeking information, help, education, and teaching at the feet of these priests who were still in the temple at that time. He was an example of this very thing about humbling yourself and being able to become teachable because he was teachable. Okay? Highlight or underline all of that. Because it shows you as a little child, he was seeking information. He wanted to know. He, was, he wanted to know the scriptures. He wanted to know the prophecies. He wanted to know what they spoke about himself and what he, and this is why Yeshua was able to fulfill every prophecy concerning the Messiah. You remember, and he even spoke to his disciples and he says, beginning at Moshe, he began to tell, talk to them about all the prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah. And so he, he knew all the prophecies and he knew, and because he did know them and he knew he had to fulfill them, he even went, got to the stage to where certain things he would do to, to bring about the fulfillment of that prophecy, you know, so to make sure that all of these things were fulfilled that concerned himself. Um, now, it says, back in the book, it says, not the, okay, he was teachable, not the unteachable or the untouchables, but the teachable. Unless we get this connection and keep it, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven, okay, or the kingdom of Yahweh. You have to be teachable. You have to make that connection. You have to keep that connection with Yahweh, or you will not enter into the kingdom, okay? You will not enter into the kingdom. Notice that word not, because this is, this is an attitude, really, okay? Um, here in, in uh, yeah, let me... In first Shaka 9, first Shaka 9, 1, verse 11, okay, it says, Beloved, do not remember, we're talking about making this connection with Yahweh, okay? Beloved, do not follow that which is evil, but that which is righteous. He who does righteousness is of Yahweh, but he who does evil has not seen Yahweh, okay? Now, of course, we can't see Yahweh with our physical eyes, right? But we can see him in his people. We can see Yahweh in his work, which is what the kingdom of Yahweh is all about, right? And that's why it says you must love your neighbor. Remember, that? on these two things, Yeshua said, hang all the law. Love your neighbor as yourself and love Yahweh, right? And so you can see that's why it represents the kingdom. Now, notice why someone won't make that connection, okay? Remember Proverbs. Proverbs 55, verses one through, I mean, Proverbs 5, 11 through 13. And notice, you will mourn in the end times. Well, remember now, this is talking about the times we're talking about right now. You will mourn in the end times as your flesh and your body waste away. And you will say how I hated instruction, how my mind, notice, the mind resented rebuke and warning. Now, where's the law of Yahweh written? In your heart and in your mind, Right? I would not obey my teachers, nor listen to those who instructed me. So this is just outright rebellious character, right? And, and anybody who has that character will not enter the kingdom of Yahweh, okay? Because they cannot see Yahweh, okay? Plain and simple. But you can see Yahweh in the works that he does. And that's the, that's the, the, the beautiful thing about Yahweh's word. Okay, continue on the book here. So he says, unless you get this connection and keep it, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, I want to touch on the word proud. Pride comes from a staggering situation that we get in. We call it strong-willed, he says, I think. We prefer that to proud or arrogant, right? You'd rather, you'd rather be called strong-willed rather than someone calling you arrogant or proud, right? You don't like that. You know, even the car in the mind fights against its own self in that manner. But we, ref we prefer that to proud or arrogant. We call it strong-willed. You know, I made up my mind. I want this or that. I don't like this place anymore. I just assume get out of it. Let's move to another place so we can, we can be together. You know, this is something that, that somebody would say who doesn't want to follow the laws of Yahweh. They feel like they're, they're too constricted. You know, they feel like they have no freedom to do things and so forth. Remember, the only freedom that you have is in the laws of Yahweh. You know, that is what sets you free from the laws of sin and death. 
Because if man leans on his own understanding, that's when he goes the wrong way. So notice, I like this. This word proud is having an, and showing, having or showing an overlying opinion of oneself or of one's position, being arrogant and haughty, notice. Okay, so proud, being proud is showing an overlying opinion of oneself, a position, being arrogant and haughty, okay? You know, uh, strong will, of course, is, is, is not keeping Yahweh's laws. If you remember um, Proverbs 11, verse 1, says, When insolent pride comes, then comes dishonor. So men who are wise are also humble. Okay, because, you know, Wisdom will teach you to be wise, but pride teaches you to puff yourself up, and of course, that's what brings dishonor. Now, you see that word insolent pride. The word insolent means insulting and contemptuous in speech and in conduct, okay? Now, in Matthew 23, 11 to 12, Yeshua was talking with his disciples, and he said, but he who is greatest among you Will be, you remember because they were arguing, who's the greatest going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Yeshua said, but he who is greatest among you will be your servant. Notice that. If you want to be great, you serve others. Verse 12, whoever will exalt himself is going to be abased. They're going to be brought down. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay? And, of course, Yahweh will exalt that person in his own due time. Okay? In his own due time. Now, it says here that, you remember, you have to be teachable to get this connection. Otherwise, you won't make it, okay? You won't make it with Yahweh if you don't make that connection with him. You've got to make that connection. It has to stick with him. And if you don't connect with Yahweh, then, of course, you connect with somebody else, okay? Now, um, let's look at that word connection, so you to kind of understand that word connection. What does it mean, connect with Yahweh? All right, before we go on, let's look at this. In Webster's Dictionary, okay, of the American English, 1828 edition, the word connection says the act of joining or the state of being joined. It's a state of being knit or fastened together, a union, okay? Then it gives these examples. It says there is a connection of links in a chain, there's a connection between all parts of the human body. You know, the human body couldn't, couldn't function properly, right, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't connected together. Even the scriptures say, you know, we're members of one body, but we all have different functions, but we all work together as a body. And then there's also a connection between this life and the future. There's a connection between parent and child, master and servant, husband and wife, between motives and actions, and between actions and their consequences. This is exactly what the Peaceful Solution teaches, right? In short, the word is, a, is applicable to almost everything that has a dependence on or relation to another thing, okay? So this is, this is true because everything on earth is dependent upon everything else, right? Remember, Yahweh created all things for the benefit of man so that man can survive. Now, notice that at the top it says here to see connect, okay? The word connect is, it means to link together or to tie or fasten together by something that's inter intervening or by weaving and winding or twining, okay? Weaving, winding, or twining. It describes what Yahweh's righteousness does when he joins us together because it describes really our body's DNA, you know, the winding and the twisting and so forth. And this is, of course, how Yahweh writes these things in our laws, in his laws, in our inward parts and puts it actually on our DNA there. Now, notice it, it said that there's a connection between husband and wife, okay? Um, because it says, you know, there's a bind. There's a connection that joins a husband and a wife together. And this is why a husband would, would put himself into danger 
to save the life of his, his wife, if need be. But this connection joins him together as one unit to work together, okay, in Yahweh. And that's the example that's used in the scriptures, really, to, to, make, to show this connection. I want to show you this here. Um, Ephesians 5, 25 and 30 and 32 It says, husbands, love your wives, just as the Messiah also loved the called out ones and gave himself for them. For we are the members of his body. Okay, notice, members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Is that word joined, connection, that they're, according to the law, they shall be in unity as one flesh. And not meaning physically, but spiritually. Okay, we're talking about spiritual here. Members of the body of Messiah. Look at verse 32. This is the great secret that I speak concerning the Messiah and the called out ones. Okay, and that's what he's talking about. Is using an example, that unity, that connection together. Okay, because the marriage relationship, it not, it's not just, not just man and wife. Because if you notice... It says the members of the body, okay? Let me put that back up there. The members of the body, okay? Um, so this is member, This includes all members of the house of Yahweh, whether somebody's married or not. It's not. That's not what it's speaking about. It's speaking about being a part of the house of Yahweh. And the example that is used here is the unity or the inseparable bond between a man and his wife, okay? It's like the bond between King David and Jonathan, Okay? They had a, a, a unity, they had a connection that was inseparable. They were so strongly knit together and connected together, okay? So this connection of joining together, this is what Yahshua talked about, about the Lamb's bride, remember? <clears throat> Which, of course, is the house of Yahweh, because that connection will be made and will make Yahweh's people inseparable, okay? Inseparable between, when, between from Yahweh and Yahshua. They're going you know, to be as one. They're going to be one family, one complete family, okay? So nothing's going to step or separate us from Yahweh. Okay, let's go back to the book here now. So that pride. And notice he says, um, probably the only thing that would, only one, well, he says never, right under the word pride, proud. Proud is having, showing, underlying opinion of oneself, one's position, arrogant, haughty. Never would they want to admit such a thing, but this is in their hearts and minds. Probably the only one who would be able to see it is someone who is trained to know what humility is, who has actually experienced it and humbled himself to know what the opposite of this arrogant attitude or this strong will that is strong in your own will, not strong in keeping the laws of Yahweh. Okay? Not strong in keeping the laws of Yahweh. If you were strong in keeping the laws of Yahweh, you wouldn't bow to such a thing. Okay? And for your reference notes, look at, at, at uh, Proverbs 11.2. You want to write that down, Proverbs 11.2. Now, pride also carries the word spirited. Highlight that, the word spirited. Do you know what that means? Highlight this. It means uh, there is a spirit, a demonic spirit that is behind and in this pride in putting it into your mind. Okay, highlight that, spirited. Is a spirit, a demonic spirit that's behind and in this pride in putting it into your mind. Now remember Ephesians 6 says we, we fight against and wrestle against spiritual forces in the dark places and so forth. They're all around us, okay? But they're there, and they put these negative influences in our minds. Now what we do with them is up to us, right? We can turn them into a positive thing and reject it, or we can, we can let it change our minds into something that's negative and sin. So you're putting it into our mind and enforcing this to where you start maneuvering to make out like, I'm only doing it for this reason. I'm only breaking Yahweh's laws for this reason right here. Okay, and then you try to justify yourself. Okay? Continue on, the word proud means like a proud stallion, too proud to beg. And pastor said, I'm not too proud to beg. In fact, in fact he says, I do it all the time. Continue on, he says, the word proud means it applies such consciousness of high stature, rank, and so forth as displayed in scorn of those ones considered beneath one. Okay? In other words, 
the consciousness of, 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 of a high stature, a high rank, you know. In other words, thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to, right? Okay? But notice, it's in scorn of someone who you consider beneath you. Okay? That's what pride is. Now, think of Yahweh. Yahweh, it, that, that's complete opposite of what, what Yahweh is and what Yahweh stands for. You know, he, he, he's not that way. He believes in his people, and he works with us. Remember, it says, what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you, you, you have even, you even work with him, you know? Um, but those words there, what, what is man that you're mindful of him? That's, um, I see, did I have that? Well, anyway, the word mind, okay? No, notice it says, um, what is man that you're mindful of him? Uh, you know, mind means to think, to, to, to remember, and to work, uh, keep it in your mind about something. And, of course, uh, it says, what are you mindful of man? Why are you mindful of man that you visit him? Okay? The word visit actually refers to the fact of, of being office holders and so forth. I think we might cover that a little bit later. But anyway, uh, let's get back to this. Okay, uh, so it says he is rather like a child rising up over a priest to rebuke the priest and saying, I'm the one who inherited the money, so I'm paying your bills. You're going to do what I say, okay? Um, and praise y'all, we don't have to worry about those things. You know, no one... No one pays the priest to do their jobs. They do it because they serve Yahweh. Okay, it says, the point I want you to see here is the pride. Okay, the proud, where it comes from and where it connects. It does not connect with Yahweh. Okay, remember that word connection. It doesn't connect with Yahweh. Remember that, that, that word connection. Remember all these things that we covered, okay? It's the act of joining, the state of being joined together. Okay, being fastened together. Okay, we have to have that connection with Yahweh. But pride is not that connection. It's part of understanding the teaching that Yeshua is trying to get over here about humbling yourself before the priest, the prophesied and the prophesied house of Yahweh. It implies both haughtiness. Now this is this is a word proud. Continuing on with the definition of it, it implies both haughtiness and great contempt or contempt in your mind. And notice, Pastor says, especially for those who would correct you. You know, but without correction, you'd never, ever know that you're doing wrong, right? You'd never, ever know that you're doing wrong. So you need that correction. You know, we all need to be corrected so, so that we won't make the mistakes that will keep us out of the kingdom. And that's the whole reason why we're being taught these things. Continuing on with the definition, it says, especially as manifested in behavior or speech that insults or affronts others, like she has an insolent disregard for her servants or her head, implies extreme domineering, insolence, an overbearing supervisor. She's got the money, or he does, or the child does, and so forth, as he was talking about that example before, and it was telling the person what they're going to do, you know. That's like an employer telling, employee telling an employer, you know, you're going to do what I tell you to do because I work for you, okay? I do the work for you. So unless you listen to what I have to say, you know, the job ain't going to get done. Well, what employer would keep someone like that around, you know? It's crazy, but that's the mindset that people have, you know? Some people have that mindset. And this is what Yahshua warns us against is not to get high-minded or lifted up to go against the teachings of the house of Yahweh. We have to remain humble in everything we do. And we have to gladly receive that information and think, praise Yahweh because this is what I need to make it in the kingdom. And sometimes it may not seem so great at the moment, but remember, to those who will accept it and use it, it brings forth peaceful fruit of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Exactly. Righteousness. Okay. So now he says, remember when Solomon, he says, there were certain things about the earth that the earth cannot stand. And one of them is a slave without sense, but with power. Can you imagine that? A slave who doesn't have any sense, but he's got plenty of power. What would he do with it? 
without knowledge, but with power, without wisdom, but with power, without righteousness, but with power. Okay? If they, you know, you can see that if that was the case, then people would really hate it. You know, it's like the scripture says, they hated a king. A king was supposed to have a copy of the law and live by the law and make sure he kept things by the law. And if he didn't, then it was very miserable for the people. Well, you can imagine if somebody who without any knowledge or understanding is in power, like you see in certain countries and stuff today, that's why these dictators and, and so forth, you know, the, the rulers, they're even the religious rulers, they have no sense, you know, and stuff. But you see the tyranny that, that some people live under. But that's the way it is for people. Okay, continue on the definition of, of proud. It means stresses in aloof, scornful manner towards others, super salacious, intelligent snob. He says, that's what's written. He says, I wouldn't call you that, but that's what you are anyway. <laughs> he implies even stronger and more overt feelings of scorn for that which is regarded as beneath one. Yeah, you know, I'm so high and mighty, ain't I? You know, this is the very opposite of humility, and that's what Yeshua was talking about, not to be that way. Because you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. You're supposed to serve your neighbor. You know, you can't do that if you think yourself more highly than you ought to. So he says, turn over to Isaiah, because the prophet Isaiah spoke about this thing. In Isaiah 2, verse 12, it says, For the day of Yahweh comes. Now, this is when it all comes to a close, of course, at the day of Yahweh. This is what we're looking for. That's when that's brought destruction. He says, when you no longer have the time to look up and call on Yahweh to return to Father Yahweh's house. You know, remember the scripture says, call on Yahweh while he can be found. Okay. Where, did, where you didn't deal with such pig crap as a prodigal son, he says, when still there was still time for the prodigal son to do so, Yahweh asked him to do it. So there's still time to have a part in Yahweh's kingdom. Remember, the lowest slave in Yahweh's kingdom, you remember that? Solomon in all of his glory would not be anywhere equal to him. That's how magnificent the lowest slave will be and how much power that man, woman, or child will have who will endure and resist. You know, we tend to forget about that as adults, but the children are going to have power. They're going to have power. They're going to have authority. If they prove themselves now in the house of Yahweh, and, you know, I, I, I got to say it's, you know, teachable and stuff, as Yeshua, as we began teaching about the class, the teachable child. One of the highlights of the feast, I think, to me, was when we had the young people speak. And we had, had the younger ones speak, and, you know, then they grew, went on up to the teenagers, to, 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 to the young adults and stuff, both men and women. Remember that? It was so incredible when you listened to what they said, you know, and the whole thing was what keeps them here in the house of Yahweh, you know, and they spoke about these things. And they encouraged us, and they even said, you know, they, they were so, so thankful. I mean, from the very beginning of this program, when, when, when the, the, the person introduces it to the very end, it's astounding, you know, it's astounding. I mean, and you hear them talking, and they're saying how, you know, how thankful they are to their parents, to their teachers, to, to the priest and to the house of Yahweh for teaching him these things and, and, and being allowed to be able to be raised up in the house of Yahweh, you know? Fantastic, man. Fantastic. Okay. Now, but we have to be teachable. You remember, that's why King Yoshiah, eight years of age, became a king, you know? That's why Yeshua used the 12 apostles as younger children and raised them up to teach them because they were teachable. Okay? And that's what he looked, that's what Yahweh looks for, is teachable. Okay. Um, the day of Yahweh will come. Highlight this portion. The day of Yahweh will come. That is, he has allotted this nuclear activity, the bombs, the sexually transmitted diseases, the mad cow disease, everything that has taken place and is taking over in the health of Satan's world to come in and to close down and to destroy where four-fifths of the population will be destroyed. Highlight or underline all of that. 
It's interesting, too, when you notice they're taking over in the health of Satan's world to come to close down what you see taking place in the news with these viruses and stuff, right? Places are closing down. But that's Satan's world. You know, it's, it's all part of the merchandise industry out there. Now, notice, he's allowing this. Yahweh is allowing this, that in the day of Yahweh, when Yahweh himself will allow the full end of it and then take over, or he's going to allow the saints to, to possess the kingdoms, okay? But notice, he's allowing these things. He's allowing it because he has to do this in order to fulfill his plan. His plan is perfect. It, you know, it, people are murdering. People are killing and aborting babies. But that has to be allowed. Because Yahweh is Yahweh. Yahweh's the creator. Like the scripture says, is, is there anything too hard for Yahweh? Yahweh created that child. And he allowed it to be aborted by, because of the evilness of these people who did this and murdered. But he's also capable of resurrecting that fetus and allowing it to grow and to giving it to someone who wants to take care of that child, who wants to raise that child in righteousness and give that child eternal life. Now, that's Yahweh's way. And people, but people couldn't understand that. You know, they only see the evil and everything that's going on and they think, if there's a God in this world, how in the world can he allow such things to take place? It's because they don't understand. They don't have the understanding that you have about the plan of Yahweh and what it's all about. Okay, and the saints. Notice, the saints, this is a vocabulary word. Uh, in fact, the, remember the word proud, I'm sorry, but the word proud was a vocabulary word. And the word spirited was a vocabulary word. So here's another voca vocabulary word. The saints are those who are, not, who are subject to the laws of Yahweh. Okay? I'm going to underline or highlight that. Or sir, I circle the words. I circle the, high, the vocabulary words in my book. Okay. <clears throat> so the saints are those who are subject to the law. Those who are humble themselves as little children, notice, to be taught so that they can take over because they're connected with Yahweh. Okay, they're connected with Yahweh. Because they are connected with Yahweh, they will be able to do this. Okay, they will be able to fulfill the rest of Yahweh's plan that would take place from this day forward, okay? So right now we're fulfilling Yahweh's plan, and it's going along exactly the way he wants it to, but we've also got more things to do to, to bring it to completion, remember. So notice, he continues on here. Let's see, this is in Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah 2, verse 12. The day, so he says, the day of Yahweh comes, the day of Yahweh of hosts, the day of Yahweh of hosts. Now, I just want to point something out to you. The day of Yahweh of hosts, okay? This is really, this is a descriptive term really of, of ownership that is expressing Yahweh's authority. Yahweh of hosts. Uh, if you remember back on page 76, it says, Spirit holy is within the framework of ownership. And it teaches it. Well, that's the same way here because Yahweh of hosts, the word host, it means... You know, it refers to the Malachim, it refers to the sun and the moon and the stars. You find the scriptures talking about creation itself, okay? But it also means a mass of persons, or figuratively of things, especially regarded as an organized for war, an army, worship, appointed time, company, host, service, or waiting upon, okay? Now, I put down a few words here. You know, word mass is, is a large quantity of servants. You know, and that could be Malachim, that can be the microorganisms themselves. Okay, Yahweh's in complete control of all of these things. Now, the word host means, you know, army people, it's usually thought of as a group organized for war. You know, that's what the first thing that the world thinks about, the world's definition is an army is war, right? But the dictionary actually gives the definition of a great multitude, a body of persons. Organized to advance a particular purpose. Well, what is that particular purpose? Well, if you look back up here, you know, it tells you. It's service. It's worship, right? It's coming before Yahweh at the appointed time. It's waiting upon others and so forth. Okay, so it's service, okay? 
And, and Yahweh is the greatest servant of all, you know, but he is over all of these things, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, the day of Yahweh, let's go back to the book here on page 78, top of the page. The day of Yahweh of hosts will come upon everyone who is proud and lofty and everyone who is lifted up. Now, I want you to notice, see that word everyone? That word everyone means everything, it means the whole, the entirety, okay, when you look it up. That's what it, that's what it means. It's not just talking about people, but it's talking about everything that exalts itself. Everyone, or everything that is proud and hoft, so everything and everyone means it leaves no one out, okay? No one will be exempt from this. And everyone who is lifted up, that is, they lifted up their own selves. Yahweh will take away this pride. Because this proudness is not something, you know, you cannot be in competition with your creator. Okay? You can't call your heavenly father your heavenly father, but yet think you're greater than that position. Right? And that's what pride is. Pride lifts you up. And that's what Satan did. She lifted herself up thinking that she could be above the one who created her. And Yahweh says, you're nothing more than a created being. You know? It's you know, like the old saying in the world, a horrible, horrible saying. Like they said, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. That's just a horrible, horrible thing to say, for a parent to say that to a child, you know? And Yahweh allows things, but Yahweh's not going to take anybody out. See, no one, Yahweh doesn't take anybody out of the house of Yahweh. But he does allow a person to leave. A person will separate themselves from his house and from him, and they will leave the house of Yahweh. And when they do, of course, they, they, they take themselves out from underneath that umbrella of protection that is there, and they go off on their own then they have no more protection because they no longer belong to Yahweh. They've sold themselves back to Satan. So it's those who lift themselves up. Yahweh will take away this pride. He says, you will see it and what it really brings and the suffering that it really brings, the hearts that it tears out of people. Notice that, the suffering that it brings. You will see these things. You will understand. And the reason, this is why we, we learn to hate sin because of what it brings upon mankind. It's, it's, it's total selfishness and, and hatred and how it tears out the hearts of people. Remember, it says the hearts of many will turn cold. The many will turn cold. Remember, the many also, this also shows the, the, the legion who's behind this influence that comes against the people, but it will tear out the hearts of people. And Yahweh says, I will write my laws in your heart and in your mind but, you know, this is the problem with STDs. There's so many STDs out there that affects the heart. Well, if Yahweh says you must love me with all of your heart, well, if you have a disease and part of your heart is not functioning properly, how can you love Yahweh with all of your heart? All of your heart's not there, especially when they go into operations and start tearing into it and destroying your body in those ways, you know? It's all Satan's way of bringing down mankind. Well, notice what he says. The proud are against Yahweh. That's plain and simple. If you're proud, you're against Yahweh. They are the untouchables. They're the unteachables. They're those who can't be taught. You can't teach me anything. You know, I already know that. You know, what well, they also said, all those things, all those prophecies and stuff. That stuff's been going on since my granddad's day. You know, it ain't nothing new. Because they're too ignorant to see it and to, to comprehend what it's talking about. They're like Satan herself. But no matter what Yahweh would say, they would not listen. They want their own way. And you remember the scripture says, don't lean on your own understanding because it's going to bring you down. They want their own way. They want to fulfill their lust. And nothing that you can say to them would turn them. They want their own way. Not Yahweh's way, but their way, you know? And so this is why we always have to be examining ourselves to make sure, you know, 
If we feel something coming up within us, then we better examine ourselves, right? Make sure. Are we leaning on our own understanding or are we leaning on Yahweh's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that he teaches through his house? With the word pride, there's that vocabulary, vocabulary word again, pride. It comes with the, from the opposite. It's from the opposite of the word humble. And notice there's a definition again. Highlight an unduly high opinion of oneself. And the pastor says, wow, ain't I great? No one must be as smart as I am. And look at all. Look at all that I got with my hands, man. All is mine. I got all of this. Remember the old joke about the person saying, flying in the airplane, looking down and telling the person next to them, yep, I own that and that and that. And I own all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I built all this stuff up. This is my little empire down here. The person said, well, it doesn't belong to you. He said, what do you mean? It don't belong to me. I own it. He said, well, tell me that 100 years from now. The guy would be dead. <laughs> he wouldn't have it. He wouldn't own it. He wouldn't possess it. It's nothing, you know. And so when people think that they have something and have the authority and the power now, which Satan tries to put that in their mind, this is what turns them to proud bastards. Remember what a bastard is? Has no father, right? The word bastard means you have no father. You have no heavenly father. And that's what a proud bastard is, one who is turned against Yahweh and does not have Father Yahweh as his father. So he says, um, continuing on with the definition there, he says, an unduly high opinion of oneself, exaggerated self-esteem. You know, it's exaggerated. It's really pumped up to where a person has this self-esteem, this conceit, and they're haughty. He says, I want to show you how stupid this is in just a moment. And notice, it means behavior. Behavior resulting from this arrogance. Okay. It refers either to, to justified or excessive beliefs in one's own, in one's own self-worth, one's own self-merit, and in one's own superiority. Okay? Well, remember, that's exactly what Satan did. Okay? That's exactly what entered into her mind. She thought she was superior. Notice this. The word, in Isaiah 45, 47, verse 5, she says, I sit in silence and go into darkness. Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no more be called the lady of kingdoms. Remember? The kingdoms of this world. Okay? Remember that word lady means queen. Okay? She's the queen. She's the mistress. And notice this is the feminine word of 1376, which is master or lord. Okay? So it's talking about, of course, the lord of heaven and the mistress. Well, who is this queen? Well, in Eob 1814, it says, He is uprooted by the security of his tent, and he is marched before the queen of terrors. The queen of terrors. Of course, with Satan the devil the chief of the demons, okay? But notice, she sits as the lady of the kingdoms. Keep that in mind, the kingdoms of this world, okay? The queen of the kingdoms of this world, okay? Remember that. Isaiah 47, verse 7, it says, And you said, I will sit a lady or a queen, notice, forever. You see how conceited she is? Forever. I will sit as a queen forever. And so you did not, this is Yahweh talking to Satan. So you did not take these things to heart, Lucifer, nor did you remember the latter end of it, which is going to be in the last days when she will be judged. For you have trusted in your own wickedness, and you have said, none sees me. I can do what I want behind closed doors. Ain't nobody going to see me, right? Your wisdom, notice, and your knowledge, notice, your wisdom, your knowledge, not the wisdom and knowledge of Yahweh, but your wisdom and your knowledge have perverted you. And you have said in your heart, I am. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yahweh says, I am Yahweh, right? I am who I am. 
I am, and there is none else other than me. You see her superiority, how she boasted about these things and built herself up? When none other than me, she says, there is none other than me. Right? That's a prideful attitude. Overhead, there you go. Prideful attitude, making herself above Yahweh. In, in Isaiah 14, 13 through 14, it says, For you have said in your heart, notice, I will ascend above the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of Yahweh. I will sit in the highest place. Now, Yeshua gave a parable and said, sit in the lowest place, remember? On the holy mountain of the congregation. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will be like the most high. See, she coveted that position. She took that position. She boasted herself to become higher than Yahweh himself. Okay. Now let's go back to the book here. So the next thing it says is she. Now this is, this is not me. She takes pride in her accuracy. She takes pride in it. I'm so proud. I'm so accurate. You know, she really thinks she's got something going there, but of course she doesn't. Her way is failing. Her way is complete failure. There's nothing there that can help Satan turn to righteousness because she's too proud. She rejects righteousness. She rejects humility. She can never humble herself. This is why it's so hard when people leave the house of Yahweh, it is so hard for them to return. They can return if they would desire to return, but they have to humble themselves. Oh, no, it's, it's too humbling to have to go before people and all these people asking you, where you been? Why you left? And all this. And then you got to go before the priest and confess. And, oh, man, no, that's just, no, no, no. I just, I, you know, we we'll just remain a servant of Satan. That's what you choose because you're too prideful to humble yourself to serve Yahweh. Okay? You know, the thing is, like confessing before the priest, man, when that first confession you do, you feel so relieved after it. Because you've been carrying that burden with you all of your life. And so once you finally confess with that initial confession, it's like a burden is just lifted off of you, you know. And like the scripture says, you know, it, it's not a pleasant thing to do. But we realize the beauty of it. And we look forward to the fact that we can go to the priest and confess, you know. It's a great blessing because that's when you practice righteousness. Okay, continue on here. He says, I've always hated myself because I can't spell. Especially if I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and, and, and got an hour of sleep or 4 o'clock the next day, my mind's slowing down. He says, I can tell. I can tell I need some food for my brain, which is rest. And that's what Yahweh says, to rest and renew. Rest and renew. Rest is important. Something that's hard to get sometimes. <laughs> I'll show you the importance of rest. <clears throat> when you sleep, <clears throat> during sleep, there's a fluid that's present in the brain and the spinal cord. And that's that cere cerebrosal, cerebral, <laughs> anyway, the spinal fluid, okay? But what it does is it washes in and out like waves that helps to wash the brain and gets rid of any accumulated waste that builds up that can cause problems with the flow of information between the neurons in the brain, the neurons and the nerve cells, you know, as information is going back and forth, back and forth. But when you sleep, this, this, this fluid that's in your brain, around your brain, and in your spinal fluid, it goes through and it's like waves. It washes through. Now, they always knew that, that um, you know, the neurons, the neurons would send this electrical wave and stuff, but they discovered this as well. So when you sleep, it washes your brain. Okay, and all the things that accumulate, because you're using and all of this stuff, that's why sometimes when you lay down, you're restless, you can't fall asleep, because all this stuff is rushing through your brain, of all the activities through the day and stuff, and you get wired up, you know, so to speak. Well, this washes it all down and calms you down, so where you can lay down, you can sleep restfully, okay? And that's something, that's the amazing thing. Now, this, all of these things we're going to learn, I mean, we have, we know, hardly know anything about the human body, you know? all the intricate details that Yahweh has made, and that's why Psalm says we're wonderfully and incredibly made, you know. But this, this is just part of it, of what Yahweh has given to us. 
to actually help us. Okay, continuing the book, he says, one of the first things that I've always asked a person when I meet them is, how's your spelling? Especially if they're wanting to work somewhere in offices. How's your spelling? Well, excellent, they say. Well, I know they use a dictionary. He says, nobody can spell. I found that out. He says, I can't spell everything and neither can anyone else. He says, that's the reason why they make these dictionaries. He says, they can put on computers too with the books and it corrects the spelling for you. He says, boy, I tell you, when I run mine through there, you ought to hear that thing that goes crazy. There's all kinds of lights start flashing and conceit, you know, all this stuff that's going on. A lot of oaky words that's there, right? Y'all remember last week we talked about the computer and explained about the, the computer gates and the functionings of that? Did y'all see that? Hopefully everybody did. Okay, if you didn't, go back and look at it and, 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 and learn because that was, that was uh, just simple, simple logics, that's, that was logic circuits that we talked about. Okay, continue on with this word. Proud, it means conceit, always implying an exaggerated opinion of oneself and achievements. Oh, man, achievements. I'm the best at carpenter. I'm the best electrician. I'm the best plumber. I'm the best this. I'm the best that. You know, we, we go on and on and on. Put any, any, anything in there, right? When someone gets that way, and, and boy, I tell you what, in the world, they're like that too, man. <laughs> you know, you go on these job sites, and they tell you they're the best. You know, they can do anything, you know. Or maybe they can do things and they can do things fast and so forth. But that's, that doesn't matter, you know. It's the attitude, it's the character of a person that matters. Not what somebody can do outward. That's just the outward appearance. As Yeshua said, don't judge those things. Judge what's in the heart. So if somebody can humble themselves to pick up a shovel and go and dig a ditch, they work on digging that ditch all day long for eight to ten hours. That's a real man right there. Because that's someone who will humble themselves to do a job that nobody else would do, you know. Nowadays, they'll go and, you know, go get the equipment and dig a ditch. Ain't nobody going to pick up a shovel. That's beneath them, you know. And this is the problem with technology is that technology has made us into no longer servants of mankind, but servants of ourselves, you know, and that's the danger that comes in it. So he goes on and he says, vanity, vanity, the world is filled with vanity. And of course, the reference note for that is Ecclesiastes 1, 2. Well, King Solomon said that vanity, vanity, the world is filled with vanity. Do you like that? He says, I wrote that down. Would, it be a song, would I be a songwriter if I wrote that down? I'd be a songwriter, wouldn't I? He says, if people liked it, I'd be a famous songwriter. And that would be even better. Then if I were good looking, I'd be an admirable, famous songwriter. Wow. Wouldn't that be something? I would really be great, wouldn't I? Yesterday, I could not even spell songwriting. Today, I are one. <laughs> says, you get the point? So do I need to go? On? He says, do I need to do some thinking, rethinking or what? You know, yesterday, I couldn't spell saint either. And very few can. What is a saint? One who keeps the laws of Yahweh, right? Remember, that's one of the vocabulary words. One who keeps the laws of Yahweh. Well, why? Why would I not be worth anything, even if I were admir admirable, famous, good-looking songwriter? He says, what would that mean? Why would that mean nothing? I'm going to show you the answers in the scriptures to this. Yahweh gives the answers. He actually gives us the answer. Yahweh called you. Yahweh called you. Why are you worth anything right now? Why are we worth anything right now? Because Yahweh has given you the opportunity to actually achieve eternal life and a place in the kingdom where you will actually guide people to keep them from bringing the hurt that they're bringing now over all the world. Man, think about that. Guiding you. You know, it makes me think of it. 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 10, he says, When he would come into the day to be glorified in his saints, notice. Notice what's going to take place. When Yahshua comes, okay, he's going to be glorified. Yahweh will be glorified in us, in the saints, those who keep his laws, to be admired by all those who have believed. 
because our testimony among you was believed. To this end, we pray for you continually that our Father would count you worthy of this calling and perfect all the pleasing works of righteousness and the work of faith with his power. Now, it's got a footnote, the word admired, where it says to be admired by all those who have believed. It means to be regarded with wonder and to be honored and praised by those who know his name, Yahweh. And remember, this is throughout the universe. Okay, we're talking about throughout the universe. So, it, you know, he says, what are we to Yahweh? Well, it made me think, this is what I was talking about earlier. It made me think of Psalm 8, 4. It says, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. The word mindful actually means to mark. The mark of Yahweh, right? To mark him so he can be recognized, to be remembered, to be imp- by implication to mention. Well, the saints of Yahweh are mentioned throughout the universe right now. We're on total display throughout all the universe. All, everybody can see us and see what we're doing. So what are you mindful of man and the son of man that you visit him? That word visit means to oversee, to charge, to care for, to appoint, to appoint to have or to give a charge. Notice it also means officer or to make overseer. Okay, so in other words, he's saying, what, what, are you, what is man that you mention man to the, those and the other beings in the universe? And, and, because, and, and why is it that you have this special place for mankind in your plan? And remember, we are very special because we're the only ones mentioned in the plan of Yahweh to be made in his image and likeness. That's only reserved for the sons of men. It's not reserved for any other beings. All the Malachim are looking at this and waiting. I love this old scripture. I think in King James it says, the Malachim was stooping down to look into this plan, you know, to see these things come to a, to a, to a completion, you know. Let's go back. Okay, now underlined or highlight this whole paragraph here. You were not called because you were great. You were not called because you were smart, because you could spell or whatever. Yahweh set a clock to ticking a long time ago, and then a alarm went off in your head, and finally Yahweh called you into his kingdom. He had a calling for you. He called you into his house so he could start training you. To start training you. I like that whole paragraph there. And then if you remember... We're being trained. Remember, he called to train us in Galatians 6.6. 6, that him who is trained in the law of Yahweh share all righteous things with him who is learning, notice, thereby contributing to his spiritual support. So if you're trained in the law of Yahweh, you can be helping, helping others to learn. Now, let's continue on in the book here. He says... Um, he says, when you, when, you came from, when you came here, more than likely you were trainable in a few fields, but you lost it. Why? Why did you lose it? Did you suspect that anything was going on in your family or in your mind to lead you or pull you away from this? No, probably if you had, you would not have done it. Well, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Now, this is what they asked him. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? That was the question. Who will receive the greatest amount of power? That's what they were arguing about his disciples, Remember? When you exalt yourself by rebellion, you're saying, I need no need, I have no need of making this connection with Yahweh. What you're saying is, I desire this connection right now with Satan more than I desire this connection that I have to work to achieve with Yahweh. So we have to be very careful because that's what pride does to a person. It lifts them up and it causes them to think that way. You know, and that's the reason why we have these things to think about. Choose this day whom you will serve. Why? It's a choice left to every individual. You belong to whom you obey, because we're always obeying the influence of some power over us, right? No man can serve two owners, because that only causes confusion, and of course Yahweh is not the author of confusion. Let no man deceive you, because we can easily let someone influence us to lead us into the pathway of sin. And do not deceive yourselves, because you can justify your own actions and make excuses for your unrighteous decisions, right? So Yahweh warns us very strictly to keep his law, or else we would be deceived by Satan into following her and thinking that she would give rewards to us. But remember, 
The gods have no power. They, have, they, can't, they can't give you eternal life. They can't do it. They can't give you eternal life. Now, highlight the rest of this paragraph. We're always going to be dependent on Yahweh. This is promised out throughout the scriptures. I will show you why we're always going to be dependent on Yahweh. Okay? I like that whole thing there. So he's going to show us why we're going to be dependent upon Yahweh. But our time is up for tonight, so we're going to have to wait till next week to find out a little bit more about time. <laughs> okay, so we're going to stop here on page 78, bottom of the page here. We'll take off in that last paragraph probably next week. And Yahweh bless you, men.